Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Lisa Unger is the author of 17 New York Times bestsellers, and she has a huge readership around the world. In 2019, she received two Edgar Award nominations. Now, only a handful of writers has achieved this, including Agatha Christie. Her latest book, The Stranger Inside, is a powerful book with a new take on crime fiction. It's complex, it's compelling, and it really should come with a warning because once you start this book, you're not going to be able to put it down. It is my pleasure to welcome Lisa Unger. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. As I said, this is a different take on crime fiction. This is not a whodunit. This, this is really about the aftermath yeah, of a crime. I, I mean, well, for me, it's always more, every, every one of my books, I think, is more, I mean, they're all sort of whodunits in a way, but they're also why done it. You know, for me, I mean, I've always really had this sort of ferocious curiosity about human nature and the human psyche, and I feel like, you know, there's so much that we don't understand about ourselves and even about our own brains. And in fact, we, you know, we know more about space than we do about our own minds. And so I'm always sort of diving in deep to character um, and exploring questions I have about human nature. This story is, like all of your books, it's multi-layered. The foundation, however, deals with childhood abuse. And I don't want to overstep. I, I don't want to give anything away because right. we don't do this. But where are you comfortable telling the story of, of these three kids, Rain, Tess, and, and Hank? Well, I think it, it's, it's okay to say that, you know, Rain and Tess and Hank um, are all sort of victims of a, a, of a terrible, terribly traumatic childhood event. Um, they, they, um, they're abducted. Um, Rain escapes and Tess does not and Hank um, is taken but then he escapes later. So they've all they've had this really intense um, loving childhood friendship and you know they both lose Tess and then they um, also wind up losing each other because instead of being bonded by their shared trauma, they're they're torn apart by it. And that's the event in, that's the genesis for sort of where Rain and Hank are both at the beginning of the book. Now, I know in your background, something very horrible happened to a classmate of yours when, when you were young. This is not that story. But no. in writing this, did you, did you have those feelings again? I think that, you know, what's interesting about crime fiction is that probably most writers come to crime fiction and maybe most readers come to crime fiction to metabolize fear. Um, I did have an extremely horrible thing happen when I, when I was 15 years old. A girl I knew was abducted and murdered. Um, it, we weren't, you know, best friends in the way that you know Tess and Rain and Hank are, but it was certainly something that I would say divided my life in in some sense. Like the world was something, was one way before she was abducted and it was something else afterwards. So it was a, you know, a horrific tragedy, a, you, know, a, you know, a life altering trauma for her family. And then for the people of our town too, it was this moment where, you know, sort of we lived in this very sort of idyllic kind of semi rural, semi-suburban town, like the, you know, the place where nothing bad ever happens, which of course is no place because bad things happen everywhere. And so I, I, you know, I do think in some sense that, you know, that event formed me because you know, I always had a lot of questions about, about human nature and what makes people do bad things and what makes people make right choices and wrong choices. So I always had a lot of questions about that. After that event, I had an even more um, profound curiosity. I can see that your books, and, and this one, has to be heavily researched. Oh, yeah. How do you get into the human psyche? How do you know so much about this? My research is, you know, is myriad and ongoing. It's multi-layered. Um, I, 
I like, for example, the 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 germ for for the stranger inside comes from a book called The Inner World of Trauma by a, a man named Daniel Kalshed, Dr. Daniel Kalshed. And he's a, a Jungian psychologist and um, he examined um, the aftermath of childhood trauma and he um, talked about mental illness in a way that I had never sort of um, heard before. He talked about in the event of, of extreme childhood trauma, the psyche can actually split. It's, it's a Jungian idea called the splinter psyche where the stronger aspects of the psyche um, emerge to protect the weaker aspects. And so that sort of reading that like, you know, in my ongoing research, the kind of reading I do all the time, it led me to be very curious about this and what happens to the to these stronger aspects when um, the, the person who survived, survived trauma tries to move towards wholeness, tries to move towards, you know, integration, what happens to those stronger aspects? So that was my question, and that was actually, that question was the germ for the stranger inside. So it's not like, you know, the research comes first and then the book, sometimes the book, the idea for the book comes first and then the research, but it's always like, you know, it's a, an ongoing process for me. So I guess on your bedside table are psychology journals. Actually, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what I love about, about your characters? They're always complicated, but with Hank and Rain, they're also really flawed. Yeah. And you have this gift that makes us want to know why they're so flawed. Yeah, I, maybe it's because I want to know why they're so flawed. I mean, I, so I, you know, when I first started thinking about Rain, you know, I, actually any of my characters, when I first start hearing their voices, you know, I see them, uh, you know, or, or feel like I'm meeting them for the first time, much in the same way that my reader will later. Um, and I get to know them like sort of layer by layer. So like, you know, like everybody that you meet, you know, when you meet somebody, you know, you see their like sort of best first face, right? And then as, you know, the relationship progresses, layer by layer, um, they reveal more and more of themselves. And that's sort of the way I feel about my character. So I'm always in a, like a deep state of curiosity about them and a deep state of like empathy and compassion for them. So I'm hoping that that's, that's why my readers sort of, you know, connect so deeply to the character because I, you know, they're discovering them in the same way that, that I am. In The Stranger Inside, are you in some ways challenging society's view of mental illness? Well, I mean, not just challenging the view of mental illness, but you know, challenging the view of, of what is what is justice. So that was like a that's a theme that you know that sort of started to obsess me with the with the Red Hunter. Um, you know, when is it okay to take take the idea of justice into your own hands? Is it is it ever? And then what is the sort of you know, what is the, um, what is the ramification of that? What does it mean for you as a person? What does that mean for society as a whole? If there's suddenly somebody who is entitled to be a vigilante. Um, so that's one of the questions, but also mental illness. When I first sort of read about the splinter psyche, I read it in a book called the inner world of trauma by, by Dr. Kalshed. And he spoke about it in a way that I had never heard anybody speak about it before because this rupturing of the psyche is actually a survival mechanism. Without, it, without, without its occurrence, the psyche can't survive. The person can't go on. So he actually sort of viewed it almost as a gift, that this is something that the psyche does to protect itself and that you know, wholeness can come again later. Uh, with the you know proper therapy, um, so it, it is a little bit of you know a questioning of you know what is mental illness, what do we view, you know we always view it as a you know a fearful thing, and you know there's something wrong with you that needs to be fixed or cured, but maybe you know that was the fix, that was the cure. When you started with this, when you started with this idea, was it always okay? I am going to get inside the mind of both the victim and the perpetrator. Yeah, no, there's never any thought like that. Like I never have like an outside in thought like that. So, you know, there would be that germ, the thing I read, and then a lot of research. And then for me, there's always a voice that I start to hear or a couple of voices. 
And I fought the I've, characters' voices. Yeah, the characters' okay. voices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think they're the characters. I hope I hope they are. <laughs> um, yeah, the character voices, and it's those voices that I follow through the manuscript. So all plot flows from character. There's never like, oh, I have this idea for a story, and I'm going to construct the story, and then I'm going to figure out who these people are and how they fit in. Everything flows from the characters. So it's you know, so if the exploration of this, you know, of trauma, of addiction, of sleep deprivation, of whatever it is that I'm obsessed about at the time, if the exploration of those things occurs, it's because they're occurring, it's occurring from the character level, the level, level of character. So it's almost like I'm, like the story is there and I'm just trying to get them to tell me what it is. You also have this authenticity with your characters. For instance, let's look at Rain. She is a brand new mother. Mm -hmm. She's trying to, to do, to, this is a universal worry, juggling family right. and juggling a career. That makes it really real. Forget all the other things that are in the book. That's right. what makes it real to us. Is this how you connect? Absolutely. I mean, and I think that, you know, even though I do sort of think of my characters as being outside myself, like people that I meet, it's of course not true. I mean, everything comes from me, right? Everything, you know, er every character is an amalgamation of my, you know, my observations, my thoughts, my imagination, you know, the things that I have learned about people, the things that I'm curious about. So everything kind of flows from that place. But, you know, the more, the, you know, the more they reveal themselves to me and the deeper that I get into them, then, you know, I start to understand them more clearly. When you first started your literary career, mm -hmm. you didn't have a family or a child. Right. How right. have things changed? No, <laughs> this is something I would <laughs> never ask a man. But uh, did, yeah, did motherhood change how you write? Absolutely. Motherhood changed everything about me. I mean, really everything about me. So before my daughter was born, you know, there was literally nothing else, right? There was literally nothing else that ever rivaled my desire to write. There was nothing else I wanted to do more. And then this like sort of little redheaded firecracker burst onto the scene and I was like just completely in love with her. And so all of a sudden there was this other thing that I, you know, loved and wanted to do more than anything else. So it was a real um, challenge for me to, to, to integrate both parts of myself. So, you know, so I, when, I was, when I was writing, I just wanted to be with my daughter. When I was with my daughter, I still have all these people in my head, like, trying to get out. So it was, like, it wasn't even just a matter of, like, balancing, like, how do I work and how do I, you know, be a good mom? It was, like, you know, how am I a writer and how am I a mother? And, of course, this is the same is true for, for Rain. But Ocean, my daughter, is 13 years old now. So she's kind of, like, like, a real person. Like, she's not, like, <laughs> she, she's not, like, the little munchkin, like, protect the head, wipe the face, you know, pick up and carry, you know, so there's a, a lot of that, like, sort of, you know, the physical vigilance of, like, you know, early motherhood is kind of past, and she's, you know, just in, in charge of herself in certain ways, and her, and her body and all that, so, and her time, you know, she's got her own stuff going on, so my time has also expanded. So it's almost like, you know, actually when I was in, in, in Tampa the other night, you know, Colette Bancroft asked me, you know, why don't I ever write about Florida? And I was like, well, I don't write about Florida that much because I'm here. You can't, I'll write about Florida when I leave because that's when I'll have the perspective on it. Um, so I kind of feel that way about like that early motherhood phase. Like I couldn't really write about that at that time. But now that we're in a different phase, I'm in a different phase with my daughter, I can't, you know, that, that part of myself, that struggle, of course, now finds its way onto the page. So everything eventually metabolizes, for me, onto the page. Do you think that there is a power that women have in storytelling, in telling crime fiction? And the, I ask this because men are less likely to be the victims of violent crime. Yes. Women are much more likely. Women yes. most likely process fear and anxiety yes. differently. It, are you bringing that to your, to your work? I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, there's, you know, there's a, lot, a lot of things that are said kind of about crime fiction, about male writers of crime fiction. 
And you know, I think Laura Lipman put it best when she said that she kind of applies this metric to, she calls it the, the Lipman test. It's like, is the first woman we meet in this book a corpse? Right, and it's a question. It's a question to be asked because a lot of crime fiction is, you know, there's there's violence against a woman, there's a murder, there's whatever, and then the story is about the male uh, protagonist who is on his own journey, and the solving of this crime is kind of an allegory for his journey, and then the person who was the victim of the crime is you know, barely mentioned or discussed. She's you know, just a lifeless, beautiful body on the, on, on the, gr <laughs> on the ground. So there, there is that sort of tradition, I would say, in crime fiction. Certainly not all male writers. There are many male writers that bring tremendous beauty and depth and emotion and richness to their female characters, Dennis Lehane, Michael Carita, just to, just to name a few. Um, but I do think that, particularly for me, what's very important about you know my female characters in crime fiction is that they're all they may have been victimized by their circumstances, but they're not victims. These are people who have been either you know um, traumatized or suffered a, a violent crime or whatever it happens to be a, a, a terrible loss, and they are on the other side finding their way to a, a new, stronger self. And I think that that's the most important part of the story for me, that you know, the, cri the crime is often not the, is not the end of the story. The crime is often the beginning of the story. And, and how we find our way after trauma and how we find our way after crime is you know, it's a worthy exploration. Can we talk about the business for, for a moment? You started yeah. in publishing mm -hmm. before you became this very successful author. Do you think that gives you some sort of an edge, some sort of a reader-to-author connection that, that maybe other authors don't have? Well, I think that understanding the business is always an important, um, an important thing for me or has been an important thing for me. I mean, being, I worked in publishing for about 10 years. It actually didn't help me get published. My publisher... Um, Penguin. Tell me you were rejected by I your was. publisher. Uh, no, okay. I, wa I was. I was. <laughs> Penguin Putnam, um, they passed on my first novel. That's okay, you know, water under the bridge. I went, you know, I published with St. Martin's originally. But I think what I knew when I walked, when I, when I, when I got my first publishing contract, is I knew that that contract wasn't an end to something. It wasn't a windfall. It wasn't like, I've arrived. It was like, okay, this is just an open door to the writing life. I'm going to give you an A plus for your social media oh, presence. Thanks. You you are great <laughs> at this. Thank you. I'm also going to step out and think that this is a double-edged sword. It is. Yeah. I mean, of course it is. So social media is, you know, for for authors, it's it can be a gift because we get to connect with each other and with our readers and with booksellers and librarians like in a way that was never was never possible before and you know readers really enjoy it because they get to see a glimpse of you and what you do and it can be a very it can be a very nourishing place in that way but don't get me wrong <laughs> social media is the death of creativity. <laughs> I say that unequivocally because you know if you have set aside time for yourself to write, and this is some, this is a talk I give about creativity, especially to aspiring writers. Like if you have you know managed to cobble together a few hours for yourself, and you have sat down to write, and instead you're Facebook stalking your ex, or you're watching funny cat <laughs> videos, or whatever it is that people do on social media, then the truth is that you just didn't care enough to write your novel. And so for the working novelist, it's, you know, it's like when you're, so like I'm, I'm a trained creative professional, I can get, you know, I can get a solid three hour creative block, which is, you know, a, it's, it's a good period of time. And at the end of that time, your brain 
is tired and it's looking. It's like looking for any kind of dopamine rush you can get. <laughs> so it's going to go, cat oh, videos. We should, yeah, okay. cat videos. <laughs> oh, we should check your email or, oh, we need to research this one thing. But it's very easy to switch out of the creative brain into the social media brain, the kind of like, you know, out in the villagey type of brain. But it's very hard to go from that place back to the creative brain. So I'm very, very um, compartmentalized about the time I spend on each. In, in a similar vein, your characters in the book are very tech savvy. Yeah. And I'm reading this thinking, I'm, I'm alarmed because I know I'm being hacked and, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm being They're watched watching. and there's this digital footprint. And yeah. I learned a new word, murderabilia. Oh, really? yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. And where do you research the dark web, for goodness There's sakes? A bug, okay. Of course. Okay. <laughs> They're called the dark web. All right. Because <laughs> yeah. you know a lot about this creepy I place. I do. I know. And I lo know a lot more than I actually even put in the book. But yeah. Your writing style does take us to some dark places, some violent things sometimes. How does Lisa Unger approach violence? Mm. Are there things that you won't write about? Well, I always think there are things I won't write about, and then I find myself writing about them. You know, I always think that there are places that I won't go, and then I wind up going there. It's interesting because I, I think you, know, you asked how motherhood um, has changed me as a writer, and um, I, I think I'm, I think I have an even darker and more twisted imagination than I ever had before because. All of a sudden, my ability to extrapolate the worst case scenario seems to have ramped up to an extreme, Motherhood <laughs> extremely will do that unhealthy to you. level. Yeah. You know, like I, especially when Ocean was small, you know, the the kinds of things that I would that I would worry about were just, you know, they were they were epic. And then, you know, like I had taken my daughter for the first time to like a daycare thing at at the um, at the gym. And my, my friend who's germ phobic, you know, she was like, oh my God, I can't believe you brought her there. Like, aren't you worried about germs? I'm like, no, I'm not worried about germs. I'm worried about my child being abducted and sold on the black market. Like, I'm not worried about germs at all. So like, these are the kinds of things that, you know, my, my darkness and my imagination and the ability to, you know, imagine the worst possible thing, you know, I do have to exercise those demons on the page, you know, which I think is a big part of why I write crime fiction. This book is anything but black and white. And mm. as I'm reading this book, my ideas and my own beliefs of, let's say, right and wrong are being challenged. And they're also changing from chapter to chapter. I think, for one thing, book clubs could take that that aspect and just run with it when, yeah. when they read this. But that was intentional, correct? Well, I mean, intentional, I think it's intentional that I was questioning the idea of justice. You know, I think that in, and it was a, it's a question that, you know, it's a, it's a question that I have that for which I don't necessarily have the answer. And so, it's intentional to ask the question, but I, I don't have a prescription. Like the book doesn't, you know, doesn't, isn't going to give you any easy answers about what's right or wrong. Who has the right to deliver justice under what circumstances? Who is good? Who is evil? I mean, I don't think that any of those questions are easily answered. I think people want there to be an easy answer for those questions, but I don't think that anything is quite as clear cut as we wish it was. You know, when you talk about like, you know, the, the, the criminal or like the, you know, the alleged sort of, you know, bad seed, right? You know, or, the, or in thriller crime fiction too, you also have this idea of the criminal mastermind and everybody has to, you know, marshal all their resources to, you know, defeat this terrible villain, right? But in real crime, like there, there aren't that many criminal masterminds. You know, in real crime, they're sort of broken, damaged people, um, maybe uneducated, maybe you know, maybe the victim of trauma themselves, the victim of abuse themselves, creating more damage as they as they go on in the world. And so that was more the question I was trying to ask: and how you know how how are there different ways to intervene before a criminal becomes a criminal? How does your author brain determine 
when you're going to kill someone and is it really fun to do it? <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I mean, you know, murder just happens, you know, <laughs> it's just sort of, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm writing about crime. I'm writing about real crimes. I'm writing about real people and real, real people do, do violence to each other. And, you know, it's, it's never like necessarily fun, um, but it can be satisfying <laughs> when the right person meets a deserved fate. Here you are, successful New York Times bestseller, 17 novels, God knows how many awards. Do you ever think about the young girl with the manuscript in the drawer who had not yet submitted it? Yeah, I think about her all the time. And I talk about her all the time, and I talk to a lot of like sort of aspiring writers too. And I always tell people that there, you know, there is not one writer, there is not one successful, best-selling, award-winning writer that wasn't at one point just a person sitting in a room in front of a computer wondering if if he or she was good enough. Can I do this? Every single one of us was there, every single one. And so I think that that's an important thing for aspiring writers to know. Lisa Unger's latest book, The Stranger Inside, it's a tale of survival, obsession, and justice. I want to thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Mel. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us on our website and like us on Facebook to find out more about our authors and join me on the next Between the Covers. Thank you so much.